Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, today's talk is going to be operating by uh, Ilya, uh, Ilya Rosenstein from MIT. Uh, before we start, uh, he's going to go around the table to introduce uh, like the viewers. Uh, thanks, Klimon. Yeah, OK, so today we are supposed to have eight groups, but I think we have seven. So let's go over the table and briefly check that the sound works for everyone. Uh, first of all, we have Amit Levy from Waterloo. Uh, OK, uh, let me, sorry. Uh, Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, let me, uh, yeah, okay, let me go further. So then we have uh, Bryce Sandland represents uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, There's supposed to be more people here. I don't know where they're at. <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, welcome. Um, okay, then we have uh, Jenny Schmerter from Caltech. Okay, uh, then we have Shravas Rao from NYU. I'm not sure, I think I'm doing something fundamentally wrong why, why this thing doesn't show up, but uh, okay, there is nothing I can do now. Okay, then we have Sina Shehian from University of Michigan. Uh, and finally we have uh, actually, I'm not sure uh, who, who, who are the last group. Uh, so if you, if you can introduce yourself, that would be helpful. Uh, we are the group from Purdue. Oh, OK, great. Yeah, OK. Yeah. OK, welcome. Uh, OK, now back to Clemon, who will introduce the speaker and announce the upcoming talks. OK, thanks. Thanks, Ilya. So yeah, before we start, uh, uh, like the, our next few talks, we've got uh, Kasper Green Larsen on uh, April 12th, uh, and, here. Oh, yeah, so. and uh, Santosh uh, Vampala from Georgia Tech on uh, April 26th. Oh, it's 43. Uh, I think. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, during the talk, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, you'll be muted by default, so make sure you actually ask questions, uh, unmute yourself, and we're going to you two back afterwards um, but yeah please ask questions that's always good uh, and yeah uh, today's speaker is uh, Noah uh, Stevens Davidovitz I hope I pronounced that correctly uh, he's a last year PhD student at NYU advised by uh, Oded Regev and uh, Yevgeny Dodis and focusing on lattice and cryptography and he's gonna talk today about a reverse Minkowski theorem um, so, yeah, to you, Noah, and... Uh, Noah, you may want to unmute yourself. Okay, how about now? <laughs> uh, so today I'm yep. going to be talking about uh, joint work with Oded Regev. Um, it's a reverse Minkowski theorem, uh, and of course, thanks to the to the organizers for for inviting me, and thank you, Clement, for the introduction. Um, so, before I tell you about uh, our work, a reverse Minkowski theorem, let me first tell you about um, Minkowski's theorem, which we will be, I suppose, reversing. Um, so, Minkowski's theorem is a theorem about lattices. Um, a lattice is uh, a discrete set of vectors in R n. Um, so here's a lattice in two dimensions. Uh, uh, so it's sort of periodic uh, a set of points in Rn. Typically, it's specified by a basis B1 through Bn uh, of linearly independent vectors. Um, and the lattice itself, so here's a basis for this lattice. And the lattice itself is uh, the set of integer linear combinations of the basis vectors. Uh, so for example, this point is B1 plus B2. So it has integer coordinates um, in this particular basis. That's why it's in the lattice. Um, this point is 2b1 minus b2. Um, so I think most of you have probably seen this before. Um, uh, here's sort of our favorite lattice, uh, Zn. Uh, every other lattice is just um, a, linear, uh, a linear transformation of Zn. And Zn is just the set of all um, points with integer coordinates in the standard basis. So it's the, the lattice that's generated by the identity matrix. 
Um, for the purposes of this talk, uh, this is a purely sort of mathematical geometric talk. Uh, we don't really care about computation. So for computer scientists, we typically think of the lattice as being represented by the basis. Um, but for our purposes, it's actually nicer just to think of a sort of lattice as a set of points um, with some nice properties. Um, uh, so lattices are quite important objects. Uh, they have many, many applications. In particular, they're intimately related uh, to sphere packing. Um, there have been major results in sphere packing recently in eight and 24 dimensions. Uh, the geometry of numbers is, is essentially the study of lattices. Uh, flat tori are sort of the dual space of lattices. Um, to this audience, I suppose the most important uh, applications are in computational complexity uh, and, and in cryptography. Uh, obviously, recently, lattices have become quite important in these areas. Um, and sort of the fundamental geometric question that one might want to ask about a lattice is how many points there are uh, in a ball of radius r, more generally in a convex body. But for this talk, um, we're going to be sticking to the Euclidean norm. So we'll talk about uh, balls, centered balls around the origin. Um, so for example, this ball uh, has seven lattice points inside of it. Um, and uh, uh, it's a classical question to ask when we can, uh, to ask for uh, general bounds or approximations of the number of lattice points in a ball given certain properties of the lattice and the radio, radius of the ball. Um, in particular, uh, oh, and our notation for this will be uh, simply L intersect B of R. So B of R is the ball of radius R. Um, we're interested in the size of the set of the intersection. Uh, so I'll be using this notation quite a bit. Um, and an important special case of this that uh, I'm sure uh, you all have seen is the length of the shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. Uh, so uh, the computational problem for this is called the shortest vector problem, SVP. Um, and this, this is a very classical question and studied all over the place. Um, and from our perspective, this is simply the minimal radius of a ball that contains uh, more than two lattice points, right? So every centered ball um, contains one lattice point, contains zero. So once we have at least two lattice points, then something interesting is happening. We have a non-zero vector. Um, of course, this is a very classical question. We'll be talking about uh, the generalization to, to arbitrary, arbitrary radii um, and asking about lat uh, balls with more than just uh, two points inside of them. Uh, so an important quantity that's going to come up is the determinants of the lattice. Uh, so the sort of computational definition of the determinant is just the determinant, the absolute value of the determinant of um, the basis written as a matrix. Uh, but we're more interested in the sort of geometric notion of the determinant. Uh, in particular, the determinant is the inverse of the limiting density of the lattice. So if I take the limit as r goes to infinity, uh, so if I take a very, very large ball, um, the determinant tells me uh, the number of lattice points that will be inside this ball relative to the volume particular, the, the, uh, the determinant is the limit of the volume of the ball divided by the number of lattice points. Um, so let's briefly see that these two definitions are equivalent, uh, just to warm ourselves up uh, and prove something. Uh, so here we have our ball of radius r. Uh, the determinant is, is the limiting density. So we're going to take our ball to be very, very large. Um, and we want to show that um, uh, uh, the determinant as defined according to this basis will be um, uh, the, the limiting density, the inverse of the limiting density. Um, so in particular, uh, the determinant according to this basis is just the volume of this parallelogram. Uh, in higher dimensions, it would be a parallel epiped. Um, and notice that because the lattice is periodic, um, this parallelogram actually tiles space. So I can fill all of space with this parallelogram. Um, and then uh, this equation for the determinant is simply saying that um, the volume of this ball is well approximated, or in the limit, it's exactly um, the number of lattice points inside the ball times the volume of this parallelogram. Um, and if you like, this is simply the definition of volume. The definition of volume is how many uh, little shapes with some known volume can I fit inside some bigger shape uh, uh, in the limit. So this is simply a definition of volume. And again, this is going to be the definition of determinant that we think of. Um, so another way to say this is that the inverse of the determinant is the global density of the lattice. Uh, so by global density, I mean if I uh, step a thousand feet away and look at my lattice and I want to know how many points I'll see in, in some large ball, uh, the determinant will tell me. Um, so Minkowski's theorem uh, uh, is related to the determinant. Uh, it was proved by Herman Minkowski uh, in 1889. He proved that um, for any lattice with small determinants, so in other words, a lattice that's globally dense uh, has a determinant less than one, 
uh, the number of lattice points in a ball of radius square root n is already 2 to the n. Um, so in other words, uh, if we're dense globally, if we have a small determinant so that in very large balls we have many lattice points, then in some bounded ball, in some specific ball, a ball of radius square root n, um, we have at least 2 to the n points. Uh, now, if you've never done high dimensional convex geometry before, you might this square root n might seem rather arbitrary, um, but actually the volume of a ball of radius square root n um, is about 4 to the n. Uh, so essentially Minkowski's theorem is telling us that the number of lattice points that uh, we'll see in a ball of radius square root n will be essentially the volume of the ball uh, up to this uh, uh, constant factor, uh, say a constant in the radius, if you like. Um, and of course, we can interpret Minkowski's theorem as telling us that the global density of the lattice implies that there must be some local density as well. So low determinant, the lattice must be dense on a global scale. This means that actually in a relatively small ball, we also must have lots of points. Yeah, so I have a question actually. Uh, so if you uh, if you formulate this theorem instead of square root n, you would put square root n over 2. Is it false? Uh, as written, it's false. It would be true if I put greater than or equal to 2 instead of 1. So this is actually a specific example of Minkowski's more general theorem. I see, um, but basically I, beyond some radius, just you would not be yeah, able to so claim actually anything, right? The volume of the shape times 2, the volume of the ball times 2 to the minus n. Uh, you can always expect to get that many points. I see, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, actually, uh, I'll show you a proof in a bit, and you, you'll see uh, that, that there's nothing special about root n. Um, uh, but just to prove to you guys that this is actually important, uh, uh, notice that Minkowski's theorem actually has a Wikipedia page, which uh, uh, is my definition of importance. So, so this is an important theorem. Uh, in fact, it's sort of like the first lecture on uh, the first lecture that you'll get in most lattice courses uh, will teach you Minkowski's theorem. Uh, so it's very, very foundational in the field. Um, so let's prove it. Uh, so here's our statement. If the determinant is less than 1, then uh, we have many lattice points in a ball of radius root n. I'll prove a slightly weaker statement. Instead of 2 to the n points, I'll prove 2. So in other words, at least one non-zero point. Um, and the proof is the same for 2 to the n points. It's just a little easier to think about. So I'd rather talk about, uh, so I'd rather prove 2 than 2 to the n. Uh, uh, so here's our lattice. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to consider a ball of radius square root n over 2. Um, and what's important about uh, this particular radius is that a ball of radius squared n over 2 has volume greater than 1, strictly greater than 1. Um, and let's assume for contradiction that our lattice does not have uh, two points inside a ball of radius squared n. So in other words, uh, the shortest non-zero vector in the lattice has length greater than squared n. This means that I can put a ball of radius squared n over 2 around each lattice point, um, and these balls will be non-intersecting. Right, so uh, uh, if the ball is intersected, then that would give us a lattice point of length uh, uh, less than square root n. Um, so this is essentially the entire proof, because now if I look uh, inside a very, very large ball, uh, uh, it's simply the case that if I count volume in two different ways, I'll get two different volumes, right? So if I count volume uh, by counting the total union of the volume of all the balls um, uh, inside of this large space, that volume will be uh, uh, strictly greater than the number of lattice points. But I know from the definition of the determinant uh, that the number of lattice points inside a very large ball uh, should be uh, equal to, uh, should be essentially equal to the volume of the ball. Um, so I'll get, so if I compute the determinant in two different ways, sorry, if I keep the, compute the volume in two different ways, I'll get two different values. Um, so this leads to a contradiction. So it turns out that um, uh, 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 we must have at least one non-zero lattice point inside the ball. Uh, and again, the proof for uh, to prove two to the n instead of two is essentially the same proof. Uh, it just requires slightly more words, so so uh, I'll prove this fact. Um, so that's Minkowski's theorem. Uh, 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 now would be a good time for questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, I'll move on to to reverse Minkowski. Okay. Um, uh, so again, Minkowski has this theorem. He says that if the determinant is small. Uh, then the number of lattice points inside a ball must be greater than or equal to 2 to the n. He, prov he proved this in 1889, or at least that's when he published it. Um, now fast forward uh, uh, quite a while to Daniel Dedouche, who's now at CWI, but in 2012 uh, he was a postdoc at NYU. Um, and at that time, so I guess uh, like 125 roughly years later, um, Daniel asked whether or not there's a converse to Minkowski's theorem. 
uh, it's a really, really brilliant question. It's kind of surprising that uh, it took us this long um, to come up with it. Uh, as far as I know, Daniel's really the first one to ask the question. Um, uh, uh, and that's what our reverse Minkowski theorem is. It's going to be um, a converse to Minkowski's theorem. Uh, so let's try to make this precise. Uh, 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 so one, I guess, non-precise way to say it would be to ask whether local density implies global density, right? So Minkowski's theorem says that global density, in other words, small determinant implies local density. Uh, Daniel wants to know if local density implies global density. Um, so let's try to make this precise. Uh, here's our first attempt uh, at a rather long statement that would be a, a strict converse, an exact converse to Minkowski's theorem. Um, we could say that if a lattice has more than two to the n points and a ball of radius roughly squared n, uh, uh, does it necessarily have determinant less than one? So this would be an exact converse of Minkowski's theorem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is definitely false. Um, in fact, it's false in a rather spectacular way. Maybe you can see how. Um, the issue is that we can have uh, a, a lattice that looks like this. So the point of this lattice is that sort of dense um, in a subspace, it has a sublattice that's very dense, even though the actual lattice is not very dense. So we can even make this explicit. We can say, say, uh, capital S is some gigantic number, and we can say that the distance with the sort of horizontal scale of this lattice uh, is one over S, but this vertical scale here is, say, S squared. Um, then the determinant of this lattice is clearly S, uh, so it's very, very large. We can make it as large as we want, but if I look inside a ball of radius R, um, clearly, there will be at least r times s points inside this ball. So in particular, I can have arbitrarily large determinant, and I can still have arbitrarily large local density. I can have arbitrarily many points inside uh, a ball as small as I like. Um, so this is a fairly strong counterexample. Um, but of course, we're, math we're uh, mathematicians and computer scientists. So when we encounter a counterexample to our uh, conjecture, uh, there's a very natural thing that we do. Um, we simply conjecture that this is the only counterexample. Um, so let's make a second attempt at reverse Minkowski. Now let's uh, conjecture that uh, uh, the only counterexample is when we have a dense sublattice. So in particular, we say that uh, let's conjecture that if a lattice has more than two to the n points in a ball of radius roughly square root n, uh, you'll allow me some some polylog factors. Um, we can ask, does it necessarily have a sublattice of determinant less than one? So here again, a sublattice is an intersection um, of the lattice with the subspace. Uh, uh, so we saw a counterexample to the stronger statement where the lattice is going to have determinant less than one. Um, but maybe that counterexample, uh, I can go back to it for a second, that counterexample has this very dense subspace, sublattice. So maybe this dense sublattice is the only counterexample. And that's what we're conjecturing here. In fact, this is what uh, Deduce conjectured in 2012. Um, and our main theorem is that the answer is, in fact, yes. Uh, so in other words, local density doesn't necessarily imply global density of the full lattice, but does imply uh, global density of a sublattice. Uh, so that's our main theorem. Uh, we call it the reverse Minkowski theorem. I've, I've got a small question. Uh, yes. So from the beginning in the conjecture, you've, you're losing log factors. Is there a reason for that? Is it clear that it doesn't hold without the, the log? Thing? Yeah, so maybe not in exactly the way I stated it, but I'm going to reformulate the theorem fairly soon. Um, and it's clear here that we can't be exactly tight. Minkowski's theorem is, is not exactly tight for all lattices. For example, uh, uh, well, wait a couple of slides. I'll, I'll, um, I'll show you. Yeah, so I guess another question I have. So as stated, you formulated uh, for like arbitrary sublattice, which you said is like intersection of a lattice with a subspace. Mm -hmm. But is it true that without loss of generality, we can assume this subspace being spanned by some of the basis vectors? Yeah, right. it'll, it'll be okay. degenerate. Out. Oh, basis vectors. No. No, okay. right? I mean, my basis vector, my basis could be horrible, right? So, so the basis of the lattice is not unique. Um, I can always assume that's a subspace spanned by some lattice vectors. Uh, but not necessarily basis vectors. Okay, but lattice vectors. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before I move on? Quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Could this be translated into something like if there is a dense set of uh, arithmetic progression, then there is a denser set of arithmetic subprogression? If there is a dense arithmetic progression and there is a denser arithmetic subprogression, is that what you said? I don't understand the question. Uh, this is the this is same like the lattice, right? You have a sub uh, lattice. Mm -hmm. which is dense. Mm -hmm. If there are a large number of points in a circle, uh, in a ball, then mm -hmm. you have a dense sublattice. 
Yeah. This could be translated on to number line, and you can ask the same question that if there is a large number of arithmetic progression, then there is a dense arithmetic pro sub progression. I see. Can this be generalized to this kind of results? Uh, I don't know. Um, you'll see a little bit later that Oded and Shaharlova um, managed to uh, use this to prove uh, something fairly similar about additive combinatorics, uh, a counterexample to a very strong variant of the polynomial free Marucha conjecture. Um, I see. Yeah, but I don't, th there is a very additive combinatorics flavor to this. Uh, we were trying to prove it using additive combinatorics for a while, um, but I don't know if it exactly applies to your question. I'd have to think about it. Uh, I think it is similar, but yes, please go. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll move on. Um, so here's our theorem. So I'm stating it now in the contrapositive to the way that I've been stating it before. So now I'm going to posit that my lattice has all sublattices. Uh, that are not too dense, so all sublattices have determinant at least one. Then I'm going to say that the resulting uh, lattice must have less than two to the n points in a ball not quite of radius square root n, but square root n over log n. So you'll have to forgive me this uh, uh, this log n factor. Um, and let's just compare it to Minkowski's original theorem. Uh, notice that it's more or less a converse. There are sort of two differences. One difference is this sublattice thing. So Minkowski's theorem just talks about the determinant of the original lattice, um, but we're more interested, uh, we have to worry about the determinants of all sublattices. Um, and Minkowski's theorem works for a ball of radius square root n. Uh, we lose a factor of log n relative to Minkowski's theorem. Um, but you can see that it's, it's uh, effectively a, a converse to Minkowski's theorem. Um, and I'll just make some brief remarks before I move on. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm presenting sort of a toy uh, version of, of the theorem. We actually give bounds for any radius r, and indeed Minkowski's theorem gives bounds for any radius r. Um, also, so this answers Clement's question, uh, our bounds are tight for zn up to a factor of square root log n in the radius. So we have a log n here, uh, that log n should be a square root log n. Um, but if it were a square root log n, then it's relatively easy to see that um, uh, uh, for Zn, uh, our results would be tight. Maybe not for exactly the way I've presented the theorem here, but, but for the more general theorem. Um, again, this is just sort of a toy version. Um, and I think it's just worth noting that, that this theorem is kind of the opposite of what people typically study uh, when they study lattices. For example, this is kind of the opposite of sphere packing, right? So people uh, study in, in specific dimensions and in asymptotic dimensions what the best possible uh, lattice sphere packing is. Uh, and a lattice sphere packing is essentially, a good lattice sphere packing is um, uh, a, a, a lattice that has low determinant, but has very many, has very few points in a small ball. We're actually interested in the opposite question. We're actually interested in how bad a lattice sphere packing can be. Um, and morally, if we, if we formulate this, uh, this question properly, the answer should be Zn as far as we're concerned. The, the worst lattice sphere packing should be Zn. Um, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but I think I'll move on. Um, uh, so it turns out that there are many applications already um, of this theorem. In fact, some of the applications predate the actual theorem. Uh, Dedush and Regev published in uh, this past Fox um, this theorem then as a conjecture and showed uh, a, a very nice list of applications. Um, so first of all, they showed that there are applications to the complexity of lattice problems. Uh, in fact, they're sort of immediate applications because um, remember that the determinant of a, of a sublattice is efficient to compute. Um, and our theorem together with Minkowski's theorem tells us that there's an, essentially a witness uh, uh, to whether or not a lattice has many points inside a small ball. Uh, so this immediately gives you some sort of NP proof for, uh, for various lattice problems related to, to the number of lattice points in a ball. Um, they also uh, showed... So, so Sorry, I have a question. Is it obvious that like uh, optimizing determinant over sublattices is easily computable? Oh, no, that's not easily computable. Um, but for a given sublattice, it's easy to compute the determinant. Oh, OK, so that, that's why it only gives like weakness, as you said, not Exactly, the, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gives some sort of like, it puts various problems in NP or co-NP. It doesn't, okay. uh, it. doesn't put them in P. Yeah, I mean, in particular, just the one-dimensional, like the densest one-dimensional sublattice that's already uh, uh, SVP, which is already hard. So that's certainly okay. a hard problem. Yeah. Uh, so they also give this very nice, uh, 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 approximation to the covering radius in the style of Kanan and Lovash. Um, 
uh, which I don't think I'll say more about, but uh, I recommend reading the paper because it's very, very nice. Um, they also show an application, uh, which might seem surprising if you haven't played with Lattice as much, to Brownian motion on flat tori. In particular, they answered a very nice question due to Salaf Kost. Um, he asked whether or not um, when you do a random walk on a flat torus, you can ask about the mixing time. So how long does it take uh, this random walk on this uh, compact manifold to uh, converge to roughly uniform? And you can define your convergence in various ways. You can define it in the L1 sense, in other words, in statistical distance. You can define it uh, point-wise in the L-infinity sense. And Salaf Koss asks whether or not um, uh, these mixing times are roughly the same for any lattice. Uh, for any flat torus, and uh, uh, Daniel and Oded showed that uh, the reverse Minkowski theorem implies this, at least up to polylog factors. Um, and there have been more applications since. Um, in particular, I kind of mentioned this already. Uh, Oded and Shakharlova have a, a counterexample to a very strong variant of the polynomial Freeman Rucha conjecture over the integers. Um, this is a a uh, question that was uh, asked by Ben Green. I don't think that anyone actually, or Oded tells me that nobody actually thought that um, uh, this variant of the polynomial free Marisha conjecture was actually true, uh, but now we actually have a specific counterexample. Um, it also gives, so I mentioned that there are sort of uh, immediate corollaries, but um, in joint work with Alamadi and Piker, we showed um, additional proof systems for lattice problems that this implies that are uh, uh, slightly less obvious. Um, and uh, Daniel, in work that's not yet published, uh, has shown uh, some very interesting connections with the slicing conjecture. Uh, uh, and finally, um, uh, if you sort of go back in time, Shapiro and Weiss showed uh, strong conjectures with strong connections with Minkowski's conjecture, uh, or at least a conjecture attributed to Minkowski, which is also often called Minkowski's conjecture. Um, so I'll just flash these applications. I won't have time to, to describe them. Uh, they're mostly for the experts, uh, but I think they're all quite interesting. Um, yeah, ju just a quick question. Is my yeah, understanding sure. correct that flat torus is like factor of RD over the lattice pretty much? Exactly. No, it's okay. exactly that. Yeah, it's, okay. it's the quotient of RN uh, modulo the lattice. Okay. Uh, you can take that as the definition if you like. Uh, yeah, so that, that's how these things come up. Uh, so any other questions? Now now's a good time. OK, so I'll move on to, to our proof techniques. Um, uh, so the first thing that we're going to want to do uh, in order to make this provable, um, this is sort of step 0 or maybe even step minus 1. We're going to replace this sort of uh, uh, discrete, rather ugly function, the lattice point counting function, um, by uh, a much more nice, smooth, continuous function. Uh, the Gaussian mass. So here I'm defining the Gaussian mass of a lattice uh, with this parameter t, so rho sub t of l, it's the sum over all lattice points of uh, the Gaussian mass of each lattice point. Um, and just to get uh, a basic understanding of this function, notice that it's always at least one um, because zero always contributes one to this sum. Um, so we're really interested in how much greater than one this summation is. Um, and notice that it uh, is decreasing in t. So as I take t to be larger, um, uh, the lattice point, each lattice point contributes less. Um, and of course, notice that this is, in fact, a, a sort of smoothed variant of the lattice point counting function. In particular, if I have more short lattice points, this value will be larger. If I have fewer short lattice points, then this value will be smaller. Um, uh, so here's uh, our theorem as I stated it uh, before. Um, using this lattice point counting function, it says that if all sublasses have large determinant, um, then we have few point, then we can't have too many points inside a ball of radius root n over log n. Um, but we actually prefer to think of our theorem uh, uh, in this way. This is actually what we call uh, our reverse Minkowski theorem. Um, it's, it's in terms of the, the Gaussian mass. We say if all sublattices, uh, if no sublattices are dense, if they all have determinant at least one, um, then the Gaussian mass can't be too large for parameter t about log n. Um, and notice that uh, this theorem does, in fact, um, uh, uh, so this, what I'm act now calling reverse Minkowski, does, in fact, imply the result that uh, I was talking about before. In particular, notice that all points um, of length at most root n over log n, when the parameter t is log n, um, they'll contribute exponentially small mass, or exponentially large mass. Um, so if there were more than two to the n of them, then uh, 
uh, then the lattice would have more than mass two. So the fact that the lattice has only mass two implies that there can't be that many of uh, uh, these points inside a ball of radius uh, root n over log n. Uh, so this is the theorem that we'll be talking about from now on, and we'll sort of uh, forget about this this lattice point counting thing. And I'll mention that one can also think of uh, Minkowski's theorem uh, in terms of uh, the Gaussian mass as well. Um, yeah, so I have a question. What's this mm -hmm. uh, r parameter rho t for like zn, for example? It should be easily computable, right? Yeah, so for zn, um, so for, first of all, notice that rho is um, a product measure. Uh, yes. So it suffices to know what it is for z. Um, and then for z, for large t, it's essentially just 1 plus the mass of the two shortest points. So I guess uh, the way I've written it here, it's 1 plus twice um, e to the minus t squared. Um, and so you raise that to the nth power. Um, for very small t, it's essentially, the way I've written it here, it's essentially 1 over t um, with some constants. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there, is there any like, intuition why this is the right thing to consider? Why not another kind of, uh, like, instead of the Gaussian mass, maybe like some other uh, thing like Laplace yeah. so or whatever? I should say that, I mean, from my perspective, uh, this was the question to begin with. So actually, this was what Daniel conjectured mm -hmm. in the first place, was that this was true, uh, not the lattice point counting function. So I really like Gaussian mass. Uh, basically, everything, uh, almost all of my, my work is on uh, the Gaussian measure over lattices. So from my perspective, uh, the, the theorem that I originally showed you is really a corollary, not the main result. Um, there are other functions that we can consider. Uh, the Gaussian mass is really, really nice. I'm, I'm going to show you guys. Uh, the rough idea behind the proof, and you'll see um, uh, that that some properties of the Gaussian mass are, are quite necessary. Um, uh, it is possible that you could plug in other functions here and get other results, uh, but at least in the L2 norm, you won't get anything much stronger than what we have because uh, uh, what we have is already tight. So uh, who historically considered Gaussian mass for the first time? Is it like relatively recent CS applications of lattices or mathematicians oh, considered no, it back no. in the day? Um, so uh, at least in one dimension, it's it's known as uh, Jacobi's theta function sometimes, or, or Riemann's theta function. Um, so yeah, th this goes back a while, at least in one dimension. OK, so it arose in some number theory context. First. But yeah, I mean, it's a very natural function. Okay. Um, yeah, it's often called the theta function. Uh, uh, mathematicians kind of call it the theta function, and uh, uh, computer scientists call it the Gaussian mass, I think. OK, so I'll move on. Um, so uh, a big step, sort of the big step that allowed us uh, uh, to prove this was to do something that's very unnatural for, for us as computer scientists, but extremely natural um, for mathematicians. Uh, what we did is instead of considering uh, our specific input lattice, so we're sort of given a lattice, and we want to prove that this lattice satisfies the bound um, uh, uh, due to our theorem, instead we consider the space of all lattices simultaneously. Uh, this is something that, that mathematicians do all the time, uh, but I had really never done. So in particular, here is my uh, sort of artist representation um, of the, the set of all determinant one lattices. Um, so this is a set that's very often studied, and I've drawn it in sort of this weird way because I want to convey the fact that it's, uh, uh, though it's a nice set in various ways, has a very natural measure on it and things like this, it's not a compact set. Um, so it's rather difficult to work with. It's rather complicated. I've never really been able to prove much about it. Um, uh, but uh, we're actually interested in, in a subset of uh, this more complicated set that is set of determinant one lattices. We're interested in the subset defined uh, now on the bottom of the screen of determinant one lattices, all of whose sub lattices have determinant at least one. So again, this is the set of lattices that have no dense sub lattice that we've been talking about. Um, that the reverse Minkowski theorem talks about. Um, and what's nice about this set is actually that it's quite pretty. Um, so here's my artist representation of it. Uh, it's actually fairly well studied. Uh, it's called the set of stable lattices, um, uh, at least going back to Harder and uh, Narasimhan, who I believe studied in the 70s. Um, uh, and it's quite nice. And perhaps uh, uh, the most important property of it for, for this talk is that this is a compact set. So whereas a set of all determinant one lattices is not compact, um, uh, the set of stable lattices is. are going to use that quite aggressively. Um, in particular, uh, recall that we're trying to minim or ma we're trying to know uh, how. Do I have a question? Okay. Uh, we're trying to uh, bound this function, uh, 
uh, this Gaussian function over this set. And notice that we really liked this function uh, because it's continuous. So we have a continuous function over a compact set. Uh, and we all learned, I don't know, in, in preschool or something, that when you have a continuous function over a compact set, it achieves its maximum and its minimum. Um, so in particular, if we want to bound, we want an upper bound on this function over this set, it suffices to consider the global maximizer, which I'll call L dagger. So there's just this one lattice that lives somewhere on this set. Um, uh, so I, order... have, I have a quick question. So to define compactness, you need some topology. What's the topology? Is it used Good. by what's the... Good. So I was hoping someone would ask this question. I didn't want to say it myself because I didn't want to... It's, it's a minor technicality, and I don't want people to get too hung up on it. But um, uh, if you like... So the formal topology, you would take um, the set of all determinate one lattices, and you would quotient out by... Um, uh, 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 unimodular lattices, another in other words, change of basis. Um, but for our purposes, you can really just think of uh, an open set being um, sets of lattices that all have uh, similar bases, where the notion of similarity here is just, uh, say, any norm you like on, on the set of matrices. Um, so the short answer is pick any reasonable topology. The long answer is there is a formal topology, but it really doesn't matter much. Um, but thank you, good question. Uh, so we've reduced this question to sort of bounding uh, uh, the mass of a single uh, lattice L dagger. And our strategy is going to be to consider this uh, 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 lattice L dagger and to use the one property that we know about it, that's a global maximizer, to bound its mass. We want to say that it being a global maximizer, just this property alone um, must imply some things about the lattice, which, which will allow us to bound its mass. Um, so in particular, let me try to show you sort of our dream proof. So this is a proof that doesn't quite work, um, but this is morally, this is the proof from the book. This is, this is the proof that we want. Um, so let's assume, we don't know how to prove this, but let's assume uh, that the Gaussian mass has no la local maxima over this larger blue set, over the set of all determinate one lattices. Um, so if this were true, then it must be the case um, that my L dagger, my global maximum over the set of stable lattices, must live on the boundary. So in other words, L dagger must live here. Um, and if L dagger lives uh, 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 on the boundary, then we can say quite a lot about it, in fact. Um, in fact, I'll show you on the next slide that we can sort of reduce to a lower dimensional case. Uh, in order to see this, we first have to notice what it means to live on the boundary of the set of stable lattices. Um, it means that there must exist a strict sublattice. So one of the constraints in the definition of uh, stable lattices must be tight. So there must exist some strict sublattice, uh, L prime, sublattice of L dagger, that has determinant exactly one. Uh, clearly, this is what it means to be on the boundary. Um, so let's assume that L dagger lies on the boundary, and let's see why we really, really like this situation. Um, so here's my L dagger. Unfortunately, I can only draw it for you in two dimensions. Uh, it has some sublattice L prime uh, that has determinant one, um, which unfortunately in two dimensions, uh, 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 L prime has one dimension. Uh, L prime is in one dimension. So this just means that it has a vector of length one. Um, but if you can try to imagine this in N dimensions, uh, or here I'm trying to say that L prime has, uh, L prime is a one dimensional sublattice. Um, and of course, we know that L dagger, since it lies in the set of stable lattices, L dagger itself has a determinant one. So that means in addition to this horizontal distance being one, uh, this vertical distance is being one is is one as well. Um, and again, uh, uh, there's an appropriate high dimensional analog of this. Um, and we'd like to use this to reduce to a lower dimensional case. And the way that we do that is by projecting. So we're going to project orthogonally uh, from L prime. So here, what I've done is I've just sort of removed the, the horizontal coordinate. So I projected onto, onto the vertical. So I projected orthogonally to L prime. Uh, notationally, we write this as L dagger quotiented with L prime by L prime. Uh, but this is just the projection of L dagger onto uh, the space perpendicular to L prime. Um, uh, uh, and we have this very nice fact, which unfortunately I won't be able to prove, uh, but it's fairly easy to prove. It, essentially follows from the fact that the Gaussian is both a positive definite function uh, and there's a product measure. Um, we know that the, the Gaussian mass of L dagger is at most the Gaussian mass of L prime um, times the Gaussian mass of uh, this quotient. 
Um, and this is uh, closer related to what uh, I think Clement asked me. Um, no, it was Ilya about uh, Zn, noticing that Zn, uh, the, um, where everything is orthogonal, um, uh, the mass of Zn is just the product of uh, the masses in all the different dimensions. Um, and in fact, this is sort of maximal. Uh, so when things are not orthogonal, uh, the mass can only go down. Um, Second, we're going to notice that L prime and L dagger quotient L prime are both stable lattices. So the fact that L prime is stable um, is immediate. We know it has a terminant one, and any sub lattice of L prime is also a sub lattice of L dagger. Uh, so it ha must have determinants at least one. All these sub lattices must have determinants at least one because L dagger um, is stable. Um, the fact that L dagger uh, quotient L prime is stable is not nearly as obvious. Um, you can see immediately that it has determinant one. Uh, uh, that corresponds to actually this vertical distance being one in this diagram. Uh, but more generally, uh, if we quotient by a determinant one lattice and our lattice has determinant one to begin with, uh, the resulting quotient will again have determinant one. Uh, the fact that it's stable is not immediately obvious. I won't prove it for you, um, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's a short proof. Um, and these two facts are going to allow us to reduce the lower dimensional case, right? So we know that uh, we can bound the mass of L dagger uh, by the mass of two lower dimensional lattices that are themselves stable. So if we already have a bound on stable lattices in low dimensions, uh, then we get a bound on stable lattices in high dimensions. Uh, uh, so we have this very nice sort of proof by induction. Um, and actually, if you think about it, when we do this proof, what we end up getting, eventually we'll keep saying, um, well, L dagger uh, lies on the boundary, so it has a sub lattice of determinant one, and we'll keep chopping it up until we can't chop it up any further, until we've divided into n copies of one-dimensional lattices of determinant one, uh, which are just z. Um, so eventually, we'll uh, bound the mass of L dagger by, well, the mass of uh, the one-dimensional lattice raised to the nth power, which is the same as just the mass of the integer lattice. So if this proof worked out, remember, this is all conditioned on um, us being able to prove that L dagger lies on the boundary. If we could prove this, then we could prove by induction that Zn is actually uh, the maximizer. And in fact, we could show that up to rotation, Zn is the unique maximizer. Um, so that's the proof from the book. Uh, but unfortunately, this proof doesn't work, or we don't know how to make this proof work, because we don't know whether or not um, a row can have a local maxima. So as far all we know, these local maxima uh, exist. But but, but uh, in principle, this dream proof could have gone through. So in a way, you don't have a counterexample that. Uh... Yeah. Not only do we not have a counterexample, uh, we know it's true up to dimension four, I believe. And we also know it's true if t is very large or if t is very small. Um, we're here very large and very small, or greater than root n and great, less than one over root n, respectively, up to constants. Um, so we can even prove it in sort of special cases, but but uh, we don't know how to prove it in general. Um, uh, so unfortunately, we, because we can't prove this, we have to worry about the case when L dagger is in fact a local maximum. Uh, so let's ask what it means for L dagger to be a local maximum. Uh, well, it means that it lies in the interior. If it lies on the boundary, then we don't care. So L dagger lies somewhere here. Um, uh, it's a local maximum. Uh, and because it's a local maximum, that means that we can actually approach this problem with calculus. So we have this nice smooth function um, over the set of determinant one lattices, and we can ask about things like its gradient and its Hessian, its first derivative and its second derivative. Um, uh, uh, and we can use this to try to derive certain properties that L dagger must have, perhaps to derive a contradiction to show that these things don't exist, um, or at least to, to say something about it. In particular, it's not hard to see that um, uh, uh, L dagger, so rho has zero gradient at a particular lattice if and only if um, the mass of the lattice is distributed evenly in a certain precise way. Um, so we can, in fact, say some things about um, uh, 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 what it must mean to be a local maximum. Um, and we could try to use these properties, maybe use the fact that the mass must be, might be isotropic, maybe some other things, um, to just bound the mass of rho directly. So this is somewhat related to my previous question about topology. How, like, how do you define directions across which you take the gradient? Good. So, what, um, what does it yeah, so here you have to be a little more careful. Um, uh, uh, but you can take you can take gradients over the space of determinant one matrices. Um, and we can imagine that we're living in the space of determinant one matrices. We just happen to live in an interesting subset. 
Um, right. So as long as as long as uh, we're working in limits where we're interested in uh, small open sets, then uh, uh, the fact that the set of lattices is not the same as the fact that the set of determinant one matrices doesn't really matter because I'll never um, I'll never reach inside a small open set. I'll never reach uh, two different bases of the same lattice or anything ugly like that. Um, I see. So you take like tangent space of whatever S O N or something like yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, if you like, you can parameterize it. the matrix in such a way, or you can parameterize the function uh, in such a way that the matrix is sort of forced to have determinant one by dividing by the determinant to the one over n, um, and then you can just take the gradient over the space of matrices. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there, there's there's nothing. I, there there's tons of work on uh, this question more generally. Uh, we're interested in sort of the space of positive semi-definite matrices and stuff like this. Um, Audrey Terrace has a whole book on this question. Um, but for our purposes, we don't need anything fancy at all. We can, uh, uh, we can take the laziest definition of gradient that you like. Um, so just to summarize, here's our slightly less dreamy proof. Uh, so our dream proof was just say these local maxima don't exist. Our slightly less dreamy proof is to say, well, if L dagger isn't one of these local maxima, if it lies on the boundary, so if it's somewhere over here, then we can bound a mass by induction. We can reduce to a lower dimensional case and, and get a bound that way. Um, otherwise, uh, L dagger might live in the interior, but that means that it must be a local maximum, uh, in which case we can try to use calculus uh, to bound the mass directly. Uh, so this is sort of um, our high level proof technique. Um, it's not original to us. Uh, this proof technique, at least we learned it from uh, Shapira and Weiss, uh, Uri Shapira and Barack Weiss, um, who have a very nice paper uh, in which they show that an important conjecture due to Minkowski um, would follow from uh, a similar proof if we could prove uh, certain bounds related to the covering radius. Um, uh, and in particular, Barack Weiss introduced us to the set of stable lattices and this whole proof idea um, in general, so, so really quite indebted to him. Um, but we can't quite make this proof work either, unfortunately. Um, uh, so our actual proof does not do this because we have a very big problem that we don't know much about um, the local maxima of this function rho t. Uh, so we don't even know that they exist. Um, uh, we certainly can't prove that they don't exist. Um, and if they do exist, we can't say very much about them. Uh, uh, so our strategy for dealing with this is to switch functions. Um, in particular, we're going to switch functions so that we can introduce tools from convex geometry. Um, so what we do is we replace the function uh, rho with the Gaussian mass of a certain convex body that's related to um, the lattice called the Voronoi cell. If you don't know what that is, uh, it's not very important. All you need to know is that uh, we switch functions. Um, and uh, uh, Chung, Dedouche, Liu, and Piker showed uh, that the function that we switch to, or the reciprocal of the function that we switch to, is an extremely good approximation of the Gaussian mass, um, at least uh, uh, for the parameters that we care about. Um, but notice that switching functions, even though we switch to a function that's almost the exact same function, uh, uh, this is still non-trivial because our proof uses properties of local uh, maxima or even global maxima. And um, uh, uh, two functions can be very, very closely related. They can, one can approximate the other extremely, extremely well, but the local maxima can be completely different. Um, so this, in fact, does bias quite a bit. Um, and we're able to use the exact same high-level proof structure. So again, uh, we look at um, the local maxima of this function, uh, 1 over the mass of the Voronoi cell. Um, and if it's on the boundary, then uh, we handle it one way. We reduce to a lower dimensional case. If it's not on the boundary, um, then we use heavy hammers from convex geometry uh, to directly bound the mass. Um, so we weren't able to use, we didn't have uh, the right heavy hammers to work with uh, the Gaussian mass of the lattice itself. But once we switched to the Voronoi cell, um, we use heavy hammers. Uh, in particular, we use uh, the L position, which uh, uh, is related to K convexity and was proven um, in a series of papers uh, finished by PZA in 82. And we also use um, a result related to the B conjecture. Um, uh, so these are, uh, fairly large heavy hammers, um, and we just sort of import them. And from this, we're immediately immediately able to characterize um, the local maxima of this new function, uh, which is a very close approximation to our actual function. Um, but this slight change uh, allows the proof to go through. Um, 
So I'm more or less done. Uh, uh, yeah, now yeah, yeah, great just time one quick question yeah. about uh, the proof. So you, 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 you say that you use these heavy hammers, whatever they are, but do like these theorems use the fact that this convex body is not arbitrary, but it's like Voronoi no. solo lattice? No, they don't. Oh, okay. So these are like generic things and you somehow just use it otherwise that, that it is not a... Yes. Yeah. So we, yeah, I mean, we use in our proof in, in some places that uh, we're dealing with Voronoi cells. But yeah, these theorems are, are, are totally generic. In particular, okay. these theorems tell you that if you're a local maximum of this Gaussian mass, uh, uh, or if you're, yeah, if you're a local maximum of this Gaussian mass, they sort of directly bound the Gaussian mass. Um, uh, if you, when you combine these two theorems together, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, okay. Yeah, and it's fully generic. Uh, so if there are no more questions, uh, I'll move on. Okay. Uh, so to summarize, um, so recall that Minkowski's theorem gives us a lower bound in the number of uh, lattice points in the ball based on the determinants of the lattice. Um, it's uh, tight up to a constant factor. I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but it's true. Uh, uh, Minkowski's theorem is in fact tight up to a constant factor in the radius. Um, and it has innumerable applications. It's the foundational result in the study of uh, lattices and the geometry of numbers. Um, we prove an upper bound in the number of lattice points in a ball based on the determinants of sub-lattices. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, an effective converse to Minkowski's theorem, uh, it's best possible up to a square root log n factor in the radius. Um, so we're still missing the square root log n factor. Um, uh, and we have some applications. Admittedly, uh, they're not innumerable yet. I can count them. Um, and our proof technique uh, is due to Shapiro and Weiss. Um, and we use this sort of topological and analytic approach that I really think may have um, other applications. So again, what we did in our proof technique that I think is, is novel for computer scientists, but not for mathematicians, um, is first of all, we considered the whole space of lattices. Um, or at least the whole space of lattices on which we want to prove a bound, so the set of stable lattices. Um, uh, we then used a property of this set, in particular the fact that it was compact, to reduce our uh, to reduce to this one dimensional, sorry, to, to reduce our question to just one lattice, uh, this L dagger, this global maximizer. And then we looked at the relationship between L dagger and our set. Um, in order to prove what we wanted. So we considered whether it lived on the boundary or didn't live on the boundary. Um, and if it didn't live on the boundary, we took a derivative, which is implicitly looking um, sort of uh, uh, at open sets around um, our, our one lattice. So by moving from uh, just looking at a single lattice, a single instance, to the whole space of lattices, it really, really bought us a lot. I'm not, I still don't know a way to prove this without doing something like that. Um, uh, so I think that this approach, uh, if there's one thing that you should take away from, from this talk, I think that uh, this approach in general is underused by computer scientists. This idea of looking at the entire space of things that you're interested in um, instead of just uh, uh, a single instance of the thing that you're interested in. Uh, and indeed, in the paper itself, uh, uh, we use this technique to, um, to show a connection between the slicing conjecture and a conjecture attributed to Minkowski. Um, uh, this uses more uh, work of Shapiro and Weiss. Um, but so even in, in uh, uh, the same paper, we already show that uh, there are other things that you can do with this technique. Um, so I'll leave with some open questions. Uh, uh, so first of all, um, I sort of hinted at this earlier. Uh, a big open question is whether Zn is the global maximizer of the Gaussian mass for any parameter t. Right now, we don't know it even for, for any parameter t whatsoever. Uh, I think it should be true for all parameters t. Um, uh, and uh, by the proof that I showed you, or the proof sketch that I showed you, it actually suffices to show that this function of the Gaussian mass has no local maxima. Um, and as I mentioned in response to Ilya's question, we already know that this is true in, I think, dimensions up to four. And we also know that it's true um, when t is either very large or very small. So we've got sort of uh, uh, some evidence to think that this must might be true, um, but, but we seem to be fairly far away from proving it at the moment. Uh, um, just out of curiosity, how do you check it for dimension up to four? Is it like check by hand or it's some computer search involved? No, actually it's kind of trivial. So, uh, uh, so I said that we know that it's true for uh, parameters that are either very small or very large. Um, uh, these parameters are a function of n, they're roughly root n, but it happens that um, in dimensions up to four, 
Uh, my definitions of very small and very large intersect. They include oh, okay. all, all <laughs> some parameters. So it's for a silly reason. Uh, yeah. Um, so another open question, which I won't say much about because it's rather technical, um, is whether we can get stronger bounds based on the minimal determinant in each dimension, right? So we have this sort of one quantity from our lattice, uh, which is the, the minimal determinant in any dimension, uh, uh, scaled appropriately. Um, but it's interesting to consider sort of this full, full spectrum of dense sublattices in each dimension. Um, and in Dedushin Regev's paper, uh, they show, they, they give a really, really nice conjecture, which I think they call strong reverse Minkowski, um, which uses all of this information um, to get very, very tight bounds on the number of lattice points in a ball. Um, and uh, perhaps glaring open question, everything I do here works in the L2 norm. Uh, we rely really heavily on the L2 norm. We rely really heavily on the Gaussian mass, which is uh, inherently related to the L2 norm. Um, uh, but we can certainly ask about other norms. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, if you can prove uh, our result in other norms or closely related, related results in other norms, then there would likely be applications to integer programming. Um, uh, so this is a very important open question, but I don't think we really have a direction right now. So, so just as a, I mean, it's probably like a syntactic thing, but if instead of Gaussian mass, you would consider mass with respect to p-stable distributions, would it help when p is between one and two or something like this? I, I think a lot of things, a lot of steps would break down. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but my guess is that a lot of steps would break down. I would imagine that, especially this like convex geometry. Yeah, so that'll, that'll definitely fall apart. Um, yeah, probably other stuff as well. Um, so uh, that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much for paying, atten paying attention, and uh, thanks again for inviting me. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, let's thank Noah for the talk. Yeah. Uh, great. I mean, if people want to hang out for like several minutes and maybe ask some immediate questions, uh, we can do it. Otherwise, we are done. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, yeah. Also. Uh, be before we leave, uh, just to remind you, our next talk is going to be in two weeks, uh, April 12th, and it's going to be Casper Green Larson on uh, data structural lower bounds. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have like, okay, so I have one more, maybe slightly more technical question. So, what? Mm -hmm. what's the connection to slicing conjecture? Is it like something implies it, or slicing conjecture would imply something? What's the. Uh, so actually, Daniel kind of has both directions now. Um, uh, uh, so uh, it's very related to the slicing conjecture restricted to Voronoi cells, so restricted to essentially okay. tiling bodies, if you like. Um, okay. uh, and uh, the connection is more immediate with this thing that I sort of glossed over, this Kanan Lovash um, uh, uh, characterization of the covering radius. Uh, so we show that um, the slicing conjecture would immediately apply uh, tight bounds there. Um, the slicing conjecture plus one other little minor thing. Uh, things get rather technical. Um, and what Daniel's shown and stuff that he uh, uh, he hasn't proven, he hasn't published yet, um, is that the other direction is true as well. If you can prove this sort of characterization of the covering radius uh, for Voronoi cells, it immediately implies uh, the slicing conjecture for Voronoi cells. I think maybe up to a polylog factor. Um, uh, so the connection seems to be uh, uh, fairly robust. I think we still don't quite understand it. Um, but we do have this one fairly simple direction that if the slicing conjecture is true, then we get um, a tight relationship with Kanan Lovash. Um, and then from Daniel's work, we see that um, uh, from reverse Minkowski, you can imply, uh, this implies Kanan Lovash, which in turn uh, would imply um, a, a slicing result for uh, Voronoi cells. I see. Uh, and just uh, completely like uh, question out of ignorance. So mm -hmm. co convex body, convex bodies with which you can tile Rn, they're exactly Voronoi cells of lattices, or not necessarily. Uh, no, uh, okay. I think this is a conjecture. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that this is a conjecture, at least phrased properly, but it's not known. Okay, but I guess in two dimensions it shouldn't be known, right? Something like this. Uh, hadn't thought about it. Uh, so, okay, it's not true that they're Voronoi cells. It's linear transformations of Voronoi cell, cells, okay. first of all. Okay. Um, no, but what do you mean? Like, transformation of Voronoi cell would be Voronoi cell of corresponding transformation of... Oh, not no, necessarily. No. Oh, okay, 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 okay. 
I mean, you can just see this with the, the hypercube, right? I see. OK. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah, very nice talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's. Uh... It, it, by the way, this idea of considering like space spaces of some objects, I think in math it's like pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So they always consider like spaces of all Riemannian metrics and things like this. Yeah, Th this is called like moduli spaces, I think. Like, yes, so that's. Uh, yeah, fun. it was very unnatural to to me. Uh, it was very natural to mathematicians, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great that uh, people outlined this approach sometime before for you. It was like extremely <laughs> useful, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, I think from my side, I don't have any further questions. So if maybe people want to ask something. But uh, otherwise, I think we're pretty much done. OK, let's go offline. And people can ask uh, offline if they want to. Yeah, OK, great. Oh. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, for attending. See you next time. <laughs>